Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about what the explosive growth of ChatGPT can teach us about getting buy-in on our tech projects. And not just in AI and ML, but I think this also probably can teach us a few things for buy-in on knowledge graphs, taxonomies, data catalogs, a number of other things. Now, I'm not saying that the standard or traditional advice isn't valid any longer, but I am saying that this explosive growth that we've seen with ChatGPT could maybe teach us some things and add some nuance to the standard advice usually given. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. All right, so what I have done is I have gathered the top advice for getting buy-in on AI projects, and they're going to be listed here. And as we go, I'm going to use ChatGPT and its growth as an example that we could look at this advice and see which of these pieces of advice proved out and which did not, or maybe did, but with a twist. I wanna first start out with one theme that I noticed with buy-in advice was the buy-in, and I think this, this covers a lot of the, the sub bullets that we're gonna go over in this video. It, a lot of the advice was very focused on uh, a, a center of excellence or um, a, a specialized knowledge where the person presenting and getting trying to get the buy-in had the specialized knowledge to say, I, I figured this out. There's this, this really cool thing and I figured out how it's gonna affect our business. And I, I figured out you know, why you should all care. And here's my way of trying to pull you in to the world and the, the opportunity that I have identified. Where I think what ChatGPT is teaching us is maybe flipping the script on that and saying, hey, I figured some of it out, but it's not fully formed yet. And it's not a full package. And I need you as my stakeholders, right? To come along for the ride. And I think that if you take nothing else away from this video is something I really think is a game changer. And I think some of the other forms that ChatGPT has taken with their you know, buy-in <laughs> basically of, of the populace out there, uh, kind of gravitates towards that. All right, so the very first one is explainability, making sure that your AI is explainable. While I do truly believe in your own industry and your own business, you really do need to know how to explain how your models work to your stakeholders because it's their money going into the building of them. I think with ChatGPT, we've seen actually most people don't care. They don't care as long as it works and it does what it says it does. I think that if we start to think about it from that perspective that we don't necessarily have to uh, normalize or standardize the, the verbiage around how the sausage is made, if we can just say, yep, the sausage was made and here's this delicious juicy sausage that you can use and try out and put in a lot of different recipes, so to speak, uh, got more buy-in than trying to explain how it was actually made. Although there are a lot of papers out there now explaining it, and I think that helps people get that trust factor. I think in the very initial stage, explainability may not be as important as we thought it was. The next, and this one pains me to say so much, because I give this advice all the time, and again, I think this is important, but the initial stage of having a solid use case for your AI, ChatGPT kind of had one. It was a little loose. It said, hey, uh, I want people to be able to ask questions and I want to generate answers from it. And I want it to be a back and forth exchange. That was it, really it. So I think that we do need to continue to Make sure we have solid use cases for our AI, especially when you're trying to get buy-in. But I think, again, it doesn't need to be a fully formed package. I think that what ChatGPT has shown us is you give the semblance of a, a main use case and then you release it to the wild. And in your own organization, you know, that would just be sending it off to those in, in your organization or even a subset of your customers to play around with. 
And what I've seen is so many people have come up with their own use cases for ChatGBT. I've seen people using it to uh, test how well it creates its own recipes for cooking, or I saw one person asking it to give them advice on how to do their makeup. I saw another person trying to ask um, about their financial portfolio. Now, I don't think you should just agree with all of those things and, and just jump in and take it for face value that it's all accurate because we all know it's not. But I think giving the, the, the baseline of what does this thing do and then letting people's creativity and their understanding of the business and their understanding of the use cases actually develop organically uh, actually proves out a lot more value to this than sugarcoating it into one specific package that you've decided on. Now that goes into the next aspect, which is accuracy. We want our model to be, you know, 80% accurate on everything or 90 or whatever percentage you want to have on, on accuracy or F score, however you're, you're defining it. You don't want to necessarily release a model that's bad and it's not accurate, but chat GPT isn't always accurate. And I think dovetailing to the previous point, because people are using their own use case. That means they're they're drawn from their own experience and their own knowledge of, of that use case. So they can tell when it's wrong. And actually that's, that's an amazing thing because then you have your feedback loop already, right? Like you can tell what people are, are, are interested in, right? In their use case, you can tell what is accurate or not, because those folks are usually well versed in in their use case. Again, that's not always a blanket statement. So you definitely want to still have all of your checks and balances in place. You want to have true feedback loops and your accuracy cutoffs and all of those things. But I think that because people are, are looking at it from their own worldview and looking at how they interpret what they can use it for. They're also very good at telling when it's wrong. So with a previous example, uh, creating a recipe. Well, if you are a baker, you're gonna really understand very quickly if what ChatGPT has given you is going to result in a good or bad cake. And there might be some surprises in there, right? And I think that's the other piece to this is that surprise factor is not always accurate, but it does give more ownership onto the individual users to then see how much they can trust it at any given time and what needs to be improved. So I think what we're seeing is we don't necessarily maybe need to worry about it being the most accurate because we're going to get a lot of feedback from folks that are using it. And then we're going to make it even more accurate from that feedback. And it's also going to help you identify what needs to be improved in the model that people actually care about and actually will use. So I think that that is, is, is an important factor here that the feedback loop is actually going to be more meaningful because it's going to be on the, the aspects that people actually care about and they need to be more accurate because of the use cases that folks are actually using. But this, tells us, like it may tell us at least, that we don't have to have the most accurate thing as long as people can use it as a shortcut to get to the more meaningful interactions with their data or uh, with their recipe or with their makeup or whatever they're using it for. They might be more willing to use it because they know it's still giving them maybe 50% of their time back so that they can use that time to improve the model and then get maybe even more time back, or they can maybe focus on something that is more meaningful than the rigmarole that uh, is their recipe building or whatever it is. And ultimately that's what machine learning is all about is creating shortcuts or getting the clay on the table so that humans don't have to continue to do the itty bitty, like same old, same old stuff. Um, and those itty bitty things add up to a lot of time, right? And so if we can automate some of that and then take that clay on the table and make it into the beautiful sculpture that humans can make it into, I think that is a real big benefit. And we're kind of seeing that play out with the ChatGPT. The next is know your audience. Um, ChatGPT really threw this uh, out the window. They said, here is 
a box you put your question in and things are given to you outside of that box now i think there's nuances that we're starting to see with well maybe you can craft a better question um and that sort of thing but i think making the the access pattern to the model as simplistic as possible uh, really opens up the audience that is using it and the audience that you're you're speaking to now that audience is is then creating these use cases now i i do realize that this is a little different if you're doing this internally you have specific stakeholders that you need to speak to and to get buy-in from i i totally get that but i think what i'm saying here is if you open up the access pattern so that even the the specific stakeholders you need to get buy-in from can just start using this and kind of testing the waters and understanding maybe this is a better way to do do it for this use case or, oh, I can see how this would be beneficial here or, oh, I see it's kind of not so great there. I think that that opens up the audience that you're speaking to and also gives them some autonomy and and some of their own sweat equity into what you're actually trying to propose during your buy in. So I actually think this is a really healthy thing for us to start to include in buy in conversations. The next is build, borrow or buy, which is a very common part of a buy in process. What ChatGPT is doing is um, first, a lot of folks think that it's thinking like I've heard people that are definitely not in the tech industry talking about it as oh it did this they did that speaking of chat gpt when they're when they're using the recipe or whatever it is that they were using and that's interesting because chat gpt was trained on the entire internet so actually when you're saying it with chat gpt you're talking about the entire internet so when you are saying well you know it's going to take an army to build well, it did. It took the entire internet to build ChatGPT. And what that also means is it comes with all of the perks and downfalls of, of the internet, right? And so a lot of the things that if you are building something from scratch that you wouldn't otherwise have to worry about as much, like sensitivities and maybe some offensive things or things being skewed one way or the other. I saw a recent example where somebody was trying to uh, understand if ChatGPT leaned more left or right politically. It doesn't have a p political affiliation. All it knows is the stuff that's on the internet. So if the majority of the internet is one way or the other, that's how it's going to present. So this is showing that um, crowdsourcing does work, but again, there's a lot of uh, nuances to this. And when we're presenting and get, trying to get buy-in, not only do we have to talk about like the resources that is it going to take an army to build, but we also have to talk about, and can we trust the model? I think what we're seeing with ChatGPT is they, they knew which model they could release to the public to get more of this buy-in um, overall and get a lot of you know hype and excitement and, and a lot of feedback and all of the things that we've already mentioned. But they had another model waiting in the wings, right? Like they had one. And that was why it got released so quickly afterwards. So, you know, making sure that you you don't give away the store, I think is important. Um, but I think what they also have shown is they released it and then they started to see the demand, right? So people were saying, well, I want to be able to use your API this often and at this bulk. I don't want to have to worry about, you know, there's too many people using it right now. Great. So now we're going to have a paid API, right? Oh, um, you know, I have proprietary data and I still want to use this. Well, I'm sure there's other models that are coming about that you can share the, the information. I, I believe the API has this already too. Um, without it being put into the larger model. And last but certainly not least is I mentioned that a lot of folks uh, don't realize that this is right now the open source one. Uh, it's a social experiment. It's a data experiment where ChatGPT, when you get in, you have to sign off to say like, hey, yeah, my data is going to be used for this for, for, the, for additional research. And people just accept it. It's like any other boilerplate when you want to use an app. And nobody's really looking at the, the detail. And um, I think when we're doing buy-in, we always have to talk about like 
How are we going to protect our users? And how, you know, how is the data going to be used responsibly and anonymized? And, you know, all of those good things. Um, and I'm sure ChatGPT also had those, those processes in place. But I think what I'm focusing on here is the amount of people using this and, you know, any other app, honestly, um, they're not really paying attention to how their data is being used. Should we update the boilerplate? Should we make it more explicit? There's a lot of other stuff in that boilerplate on this is exactly how your data is being used. Do you want more information on, on what that means? I think like additional education. I know a lot of folks might push back on this and say, it's not my job to educate people. It should be on their their shoulders to educate themselves. I think what we're we're seeing is there are so many advancements going on right now that people's trust in AI and the systems and the apps and the other things that they're using is still in a decade where the amount of data and the type of data and the way data could be used was still relatively, again, relatively limited compared to what it is today. And I think they're understanding, again, they meaning everyone, right? I, I do believe this even of myself sometimes, even though I know a lot about data, I think it it's it's outdated. And I think we do need to really think about this as 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 a collective for doing good um, to to help, again, bring people along for the ride with us that we have to start educating. We have to say like, no, the boilerplate is not enough. Yeah, legally they signed off on it. But do they actually know, was their consent actually well informed? I don't know. I don't know if it's true. I think this is an area that we do need to start to explore with any AI project. I do want to say like this is an unprecedented time. And I think there's so much cool stuff that we can learn from this. I think overall it is a net positive about what ChatGPT is teaching us. Again, not speaking to the model itself and what it's being used for and that sort of thing. Um, but I do find this is a really cool thing for us to start to pick up on lessons learned and how we can maybe roll that into some of our own practices to make them more successful. All right, so with that, I hope this video has been insightful or at least made you think about some of the certain things that you're working on today. And with that, I wanna thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.